Hello and welcome to Roundtable. The man described as a mini Trump who runs a country of just two million people in Eastern Europe now has the chance to shape the European Union for years to come. Janis Jansa, Prime Minister of Slovenia, will chair the EU Council presidency at a time when he's said to be aligned to the anti-EU forces of both Poland and Hungary. So what is in store and what are the Slovenians' real ambitions? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Freedom of the press and freedom of the judiciary are both said to be under threat in Slovenia. Jansa was also criticised this week for stating the EU will not open any European migration corridors for Afghanistan. Can any kind of even-handedness be expected? Slovenia took over the EU presidency amidst a wave of criticism against its Conservative Prime Minister, Janis Jansa. Jansa has been accused of infringing on Slovenia's media freedoms and the independence of the judiciary. He also has a reputation of offending on Twitter EU officials who've expressed their concerns over democracy in Slovenia. And he expresses strong opinions about the European Union itself. He tweeted in May, we owe the EU nothing. We fought for our freedom and democracy 30 years ago. Critics worry Jansa may undermine the rule of law in the EU. Trust that sound measures to fight corruption and fraud are in place. Trust in free media and independent courts. I mean, this is also important for European taxpayers because they ultimately finance the recovery. And therefore, I count on the Slovenian government to continue the important work on the rule of law files. This week, Jansa will participate in the Bled Strategic Forum Future of Europe, a conference which aims, as it puts it, to exchange views and seek innovative solutions to present and future challenges in Central and Southern Europe. Critics worry that it is in these settings that Jansa could influence the EU institutions away from democracy. Can Slovenia's Prime Minister reflect and uphold the EU's vision? Time for us to go straight to Slovenia, to Ljubljana, in fact, and there we see Giga Turk, former Slovenian Minister for Growth, and then to Poland, Warsaw, and Wojciech Szybelski joins us from there, editor-in-chief at Visegrad Insight. And in London, we find Alan Toplyshek, lecturer in international political economy at King's College London. Jigga, let me come to you first of all and examine Janis Jansa as a human being rather than simply as a politician. Is he a bully, as many have suggested with his Twitter rants, or is it just bluster? Oh, I think it's neither. I think he's... Uh regular Slovenian politician uh, from the wrong side, so to say, um, always um, in the weaker position, always kind of trying to catch up, always trying to um, kind of um, um, create a balance in Slovenian politics. You know, Slovenian politics has been dominated by the legacy of the communist regime in every way uh, imaginable. And from time to time, Jansha or somebody else comes to power these uh, new democratic forces may be one quarter of the time. Uh, we never had a president that would not be kind of destined by the former communist regime to make a good political career. Um, so it's, uh, it's a political struggle trying to create balance. Why is he so angry then with the European Union if it gives him so much money, his country, his people? I think ten and a half billion has been promised over the next six years. I don't think he's, uh, he's angry with the European Union at all. Maybe the European Union um, tries to be angry with him based on some of the um, smearing that is coming into Brussels from Slovenia. Um, the Social Democratic, the Slovenian Democratic Party and the, in general the Slovenian centre-right has been the most pro-European uh, in the Slovenian political spectrum. So... Um, I don't know where you would have this idea that he's angry at Brussels.
OK, well, let's go to you, Alan. Um, Mini Trump is a nickname. Is it right, as Jigger is suggesting, that these kind of smears, these kind of labels are unjustified and they, they've come from outside? Uh, yeah, it's an unfortunate situation uh, that we have a prime minister in Slovenia who always portrays himself to be in the victim position. Um, of course, Janis Janša has, has uh, made some great achievements for the independence of Slovenia and in the early years and also uh, this, uh, and people show this in Slovenia, uh, citizens from the different sides of the political spectrum. But then uh, the longer he stayed on the political scene, 10 years, 20 years, uh, and now 30 years on the political scene in Slovenia, people are getting a bit uh, upset with Janis Janša and with his uh, outbursts uh, and his comments, very derogatory comments and uh, and uh, and also xenophobic comments, sexist comments, uh, anti-immigrant comments, uh, and it doesn't really bring people together. Uh, I don't see Giga Turk's uh, comment that he's trying to bring the uh, to, to, to cause the balance uh, or to put uh, Slovenian politics at, a, at the right balance. He's actually causing a disbalance. Uh, he's causing havoc in Slovenian politics. Okay, well, just going back to so, something, I can see you shaking your head, Jigra. I'll give you another chance in just a moment. But going back to something um, you said, you said he's not anti EU, but I mentioned at the start of the program, he said, We owe the EU nothing. We fought for our freedom and democracy 30 years ago. Um, Wojciech, you believe that he and his government want to pick a fight with the European Union, correct? Well, not a fight with the European Union, but definitely um, the Prime Minister of Slovenia is portraying himself at odds with the mainstream of the uh, uh, political elites currently, uh, uh, you know, setting the grounds on um, whatever foreign policy uh, of the European Union or on the questions of, of, of rule of law, these elements that um, Central Europeans, together with Poland and Hungary, uh, were, were causing a lot of trouble uh, inside of the EU. So he's, he's betting on the other side of, uh, of things that, that, the, that the most of the democratic countries uh, of Europe uh, would bet uh, currently, and that is you know, I see it as on one side beneficial for his internal game. It polarizes the the political spectrum in in Slovenia. It's a similar method uh, Viktor Orban uses in Hungary and Kaczynski in Poland. And at the same time, he he's able to to mobilize his electorate uh, and to uh, also show that he, despite this rhetoric, delivers. Uh, after all, Slovenia is benefiting from EU funds. It is currently the uh, presiding country of the EU presidency, rotating presidency in the Let's European Union. Let's hear from Ursula von der Leyen. Last time these two met, it appeared a little bit frosty. Um, this was something she had to say. Indeed, the beginning of a new presidency is always a very special moment. Slovenia is taking the helm of Europe's leadership at a turning point for our union. Our vaccination campaign is progressing fast. The European Union is cautiously reopening. We're shifting now from crisis management to long-term recovery efforts. And Next Generation EU is kind of the engine of this recovery. It will be up to us together to steer this recovery and make sure it works smooth and fast on the ground. Jigger, up to us all of us, the younger members of the European Union, you, Slovenia, she seems to be saying, up to us to make this a success. Is that a kind of warning? No, I think it's, uh, it's a perfectly normal, normal Brussels rhetoric. Of course, everybody has to uh, work towards recovery. The recovery is high on the agenda. Going back to your um, comment of Slovenia owing nothing, you know, to Brussels, uh, maybe this is related to the attitude which is uh, sometimes a little bit patronizing um, when it comes to Brussels, when it comes to old member states towards the new member states. I mean, we are still being called as new member states more than 10 years after we have joined. Um, so, no, we feel we are equal members of the European Union and we are um, very much ready to contribute to its success, the Slovenian presidency um, as well. Uh, so... Um, 
I, I think there's a need, you know, by the journalists, by some intellectuals to create a kind of narrative that there's another country going down the same path as, um, as Poland and Hungary. But the situation in Slovenia, if you would just look at the numbers of the share of votes of the power that Mr. Janša has, uh, the situation is, is totally different. And I uh, really don't very much like the position I have here, apparently, as a kind of an advocate of, of Mr. Janša. I was a member of his party. I stepped out um, after some time. Um, but, you know, I think it's important for every democracy that there is a substantial exchange of power. And this is what is happening now in Slovenia. And this is what is causing a lot of hysteria with those who are used to be on power since 1945, basically. I will ask you now what you think Slovenia hopes to achieve, what it wants to do. Well, you know, when it comes to presidency, this is the second European presidency that uh, we are having. I was part of the team that was in the presidency in 2008. And I think the most important uh, thing that uh, happens is that happened in 2008 was that we started to look at European Union as something which is ours, as something which we look kind of eye to eye into, not something that we look up, uh, you know, doing the homeworks uh, that we did uh, to join the European Union. Um, it's an opportunity for everyone. It gets a little bit of uh, exposure to Slovenia, to Slovenian business, to Slovenian business infrastructure, to foreign investment in Slovenia, to Slovenian tourism. Um, Slovenian scientists, researchers, NGOs, whoever appears on any forum in Europe gets in this half year a little bit of special attention. Uh, and if he or she has something to say, if he or she has something to contribute, um, he or she would also be maybe remembered um, um, in the future. And uh, last but not least, you know, uh, it gives Slovenia a possibility to maybe bend a little bit some European policies um, in the way Slovenia sees important. We have an ongoing debate on the future of Europe right now. There's a lot of debate on how to deepen European Union, how to make it an ever closer union. Uh, what Slovenia, for example, wants is to show the vitality of the European project by expanding it to the countries which would deserve European membership and are progressing very slowly. And I'm speaking of, of course, of the Balkans, of, of Bosnia, Montenegro, Serbia, um, former, um, I mean, uh, Northern Macedonia and, and Albania. Yeah, and this so is, I think it would demonstrate the vitality of the union if steps would be made to uh, towards enlargement. For, forgive me for bending you on that point, but Alan, I see you're nodding and it was about the Balkans that I wanted to go to next. If that is one of Slovenia's overriding ambitions with the presidency, is it going to be successful? in getting the weight of member countries behind the idea, or will it face opposition? Well, it's been facing opposition for some time now, uh, for example, from countries like uh, France, for example. Uh, in the last, in the recent years, uh, France has become uh, colder to the prospect of uh, further enlargement. And there's there's been, since the Eurozone crisis of 2011-2012, uh, a sentiment amongst the, the European leaders and also, and also the mainly the older member states uh, that there should be further deepening and strengthening of the co cohesion within the EU and deepening of the European integration first and then further enlargement of the EU. Whereas the newer member states and amongst them is of course also Slovenia because of its close links with the Western Balkans because we used to be part of the same country ex Yugoslavia. Uh, Slovenia, of course, has many important interests here, and I think uh, it's very important that Slovenia plays this role rather than, for example, Austria. Uh, so I think that it's good that we have this active role. Uh, and maybe this is one, one I would say, one good thing that I think maybe Janis Janša is doing, so I'm not just going to be saying uh, critical things, is that he has shown that Slovenia can be a more active uh, player on the European scene, even though I don't agree with the direction that he's trying to pull Slovenia towards. But I think that, that that's, that's good in terms of uh, cooperation with the so-called newer member states, uh, so the Central European states, so uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia. I think that's a good thing. And also with the Western Balkans to further uh, enlarge the EU and to make the EU more stable uh, in the region. Wojciech, um, this is where it becomes a little difficult, doesn't it? Because there is a great importance in maintaining, from Slovenia's point of view, good relations with the biggest members of the European Union, particularly France and Germany. And yet we have its central plank for the EU presidency, council presidency enlargement, which France is dead against. How does it 
keep the two sides happy this way? Slovenia like, so far hasn't hasn't uh, had any blunder with the uh, with the EU presidency. There is a tension uh, of uh, of what uh, Mr. Jansa, for instance, is saying on uh, on the international forum recently, also on Iran, uh, and then you know there is some sort of a, a, a power strike or competition, uh, institutional competition uh, coming from Mr. Borrell, who was. Who was seeking, uh, 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 you know, to to have this role, of course, and nominally and and institutionally, he is to be the voice of Europe and not uh, necessarily prime minister of a presiding country. So there is an interesting dynamic, and there is definitely an ambition shown by by Slovenia in this process, which uh, we will we will observe also during the French presidency. Of course, Mr. Macron initiated uh, as part of his domestic setup. The, the conference on the future of Europe, a very important discussion for Europe, but it is driven by um, the, the internal dynamics of, of France. So there will be a different game. Overall, I would like to emphasize, though, that uh, Slovenia, just like my predecessor uh, said, is seeing its opportunity in building a stronger Central Eastern European flank of European Union, kind of bringing together voices in the region in order to be more influential for the benefit of the whole EU. Wojciech, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later and go into in more depth your suggestion that um, Slovenia doesn't necessarily want to pick a fight with the European Union because I have it in my notes. You said it wants to build virtual conflicts while taking all of the benefits. We will address that in just a moment. But Giga Turk, you were either looking like you wanted to disagree or agree, but certainly that you wanted to say something. No, no, uh, I, I largely agree with what uh, Wojciech was saying, except, uh, you know, um, indeed, uh, you know, Mr. Yansha commented um, the situation in, in Iran. He commented, he commented on the uh, Afghanistan um, migration or potential migration. And I think this is perfectly normal in politics. Uh, I don't think anyone would uh, have a problem if Mr. Macron or Mr. Merkel would say something. And um, actually, he does not have a formal position in the European structure. So it's not the presidency of the Council of Europe uh, that, uh, that he has. It has a permanent president. But it is true that his voice has a little bit more um, visibility. And he's trying to say what he thinks. I think it's important that all European voices, all the countries have their say about issues and not just, you know, waiting what France or Germany will say. Yeah. Well, let, let's hear your thoughts on the suggestion from outside, perhaps, uh, that uh, the rule of law is under attack in Slovenia, that the judiciary is being attacked, that the, the press is being attacked. Do you, you think these are, are slurs, that it's all unwarranted? Um, as I said, you know, there's an attempt to squeeze somehow what is happening in Slovenia into the Polish or into the Hungarian playbook. Mr. Jansha does not have the votes in the parliament to do anything, even if he would want to. And as far as the rule of law is concerned, if you would look at some of the UN or OECD or uh, World Economic Forum statistics, you would find that the for example, speed of judiciary, how long, how efficient is if you go to court and you get your rights at court. Slovenia is at the very bottom there. So the problem with the rule of law in Slovenia is not that there would be under political attack. It is that it is functioning very slowly and unfortunately the government cannot do anything about it. But he also criticised two judges. To, he criticised two of, judges you know, proposing together with a political party saying that they shouldn't share their affiliation when it's allowed by law. Um, Mr. Jansha was actually demonstrating that the Slovenian judiciary is the exact descendant from the judiciary system that existed before the fall of the Berlin Wall. No judge was dismissed. The judges that were appointed by the communist regime are now taking uh, their successor, giving jobs to their successors. Um, so there may be, I'm not saying that it is, maybe there could be a little bit of bias. And, you know, you have anecdotal kind of evidence that the problem is actually on the other side. There is a lot of talk about the problems of journalism and journalists. There was a journalist was in Slovenia 
beaten almost to death, but it was a right-wing journalist. There were 20 or 25 judicial cases against a politician in Slovenia uh, who were all, he was acquitted on all 25 cases, not 25, uh, uh, it was not, so 25 different procedures. Uh, found not guilty on all of them, he was a right, a center-right politician. Okay, so you, you, did, you think there the may be some kind Prime of Minister bias? Yasha on the Patria. It was also um, showing the strength of rule by law by the left, not by the right. Okay, you think there may be some kind of bias and that perhaps he is trying to address that? The criticism is not that, that he's just trying to dismantle the judiciary. We have to no, leave that... No, he's not trying to dismantle no, the I, judiciary. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, absolutely. You're making a point very well. Well, and clear. Alan, let me come to you. Giga's making the suggestion there that he doesn't have an awful lot of support, that he hasn't got the backing that his counterparts in Poland and Hungary have. And indeed, I think there have to be elections before June of next year. It's quite likely then that a centre-left government may well come in. What would it try to dismantle of what the current Slovenian government has put in place? And also, by extension, what it might try to achieve uh, with the council presidency? Uh, well, yeah. If So we need to have the, the next parliament elections before June 2022, before June next year. Uh, and when we look at the current polling uh, of the public opinion uh, on the uh, voting sentiment, we see that uh, the S uh, SDS, or the S Slovenian Democratic Party, would again come first. So Janša would come first, but uh, his two ju junior coalition partners would be, they wouldn't pass the, the electoral tr uh, threshold. Um, so let's see if that really happens. But if that were to happen, then we, we know certainly that we would have another centre-left uh, government. Uh, and some of the leaders of the opposition party, centre-left opposition parties, have already said that the first thing that they would do if they come into power uh, that they would take, they would replace all the political appointments that uh, Yanis Janša or this government has made. Uh, for example, the, the general director of the police um, uh, and, and different positions, different independent institutions. So this is where the power comes. So even though the current government doesn't have the votes uh, in the parliament uh, to yeah. pass through important legislation, they can still make political appointments. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm I'm a bit worried about um, the amount of time that we have left on the program. So. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to put up on the screen something that uh, Janis Janser tweeted in the last few days. It is not the duty of the European Union or Slovenia to help everyone on the planet who is fleeing instead of fighting for their homeland. And that was over some pictures of some Afghan women who had remained behind uh, when he felt that the men of Afghanistan were actually cutting and running out of the country. My point with this is to say, is it this kind of statement that could be an embarrassment to the Slovenian presidency of the council, or does it reflect the reality not only of public opinion in Slovenia, but in certain European countries? Well, that's a very good uh, point. And according to Eurobarometer, Slovenians are one of the most uh, Euro-enthusiastic or European integration-supportive societies. Uh, uh, you know, let alone existing structures uh, of, of the European Union, but they also are, according to the polls uh, from winter, this, this winter, this last winter, the Slovenians are also in vastly supportive of, of a defense integration, kind of, you know, acting together on principled uh, de defense questions. You, you know, again, uh, how realistic that is to implement, that's a secondary uh, question. So I think that's um, there is there is a there is a bit of a domestic game overplaying the communication you know in on on, on Europe uh, that needs to be understood and perhaps also from external point of view ours I mean non non Slovenian it looks a little bit different I think I... and my perception is that uh, it's exploitation of uh, certain European weaknesses for the. Uh, domestic let us, get, let us go to a Slovenian for the final word on this. I, I posed the question at the beginning of the programme, could this shape the European Union for years to come, the Council presidency? Well, what are your thoughts? Giga, before we say goodbye. Uh, no, not at all. I think you're exaggerating. Um, 
Slovenia is, is a friendly country, friendly to tourists, friendly to foreign students, uh, friendly to investment. Uh, we have severe, you know, political ideological fighting among ourselves. I think partly because there's no balance in power, partly because there's a David and there's a Goliath, and the Goliath is the left and the David is the right. But otherwise, you know, um, you're welcome to come here, you're welcome to invest, you're welcome to study in Slovenia. Um, and um, in the end of the day, you know, you have a lot of rhetoric, you have a lot of, you may have a lot of tweets, uh, but the policies that you will see come out of Slovenia will be pro-European uh, and will be uh, for the better future of the, of the community as a whole. Look, great to be able to shine a light on one of the... I without being rude, one of the lesser-known nations of the European Union, although, as you say, Giga, it has been hugely influential and will continue to be so. Thank you for joining us on this programme. Thank you for watching this edition of Roundtable. From me, David Foster, we hope to have your company next time. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>